she whom the sages and seers know and remember as the imperishable Shakti. Is the inherent meaning in all the slokas and mantras of the revealed scriptures. Without her, O oh fair one, all the tattvas and cosmic principles would be like clouds with no rain. She is the perfect eye consciousness, inherent in all the multitude of words and the essence of non-duality, whose very being is intrinsic meaning in all. Om peace, peace, peace. Om Vedanta Siddhanta Nirukti Resha Brahmaiva Jivaham Sakalam Jagadcha Akanda Rupa Stitir Eva Moksho Brahmad Vitiye Shutayaha Pramanam Om Shantihi 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 It is the apt and final conclusion of the Vedanta that all is Brahman. Time, space, living beings, and the world. Living in constant recognition of this fact is what is called enlightenment. Brahman is pure and perfect and one without a second. And the revealed scriptures are the sure and certain proof of this fact. Om peace, peace, peace. Om Sahana, Om Sahana, Vavatu, Sahana, Obunaktu, Sahaviryam, Karavo, Vahoi, Dejasvi, Navadi, Tamastu, Mavidvi, Shovahai, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. May Brahman, the reality, protect us. May Brahman sustain us. May Brahman illumine our thinking consciousness. May we not find fault with each other, with the world, or with the teachings. And may what we study be a source of inspiration to us eternally. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us, and may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om. We are about to enter into our second class on the teachings of mantra, um, a word that whose meaning has gotten around even here in the Western cultures in this day and age. It's a Sanskrit word, and a few of them have gotten around, like karma and guru and hopefully shanti. Uh, but um, the deep ramifications of mantra go very profoundly with the meaning in words and so you couldn't come up to a Vedantist uh, and say uh, it, uh, what's in a word for instance if you had a, a sort of idea that words are superfluous or surface only or there's too many of them um, you're just coming at it from the wrong uh, direction and we'll have a chart on that probably in the second half about kama, uh, Kamakala and the meaning of mantra and and uh, how there are higher grade mantras and lower grade mantras. So if you had the idea that there was intelligence inherent in every word and you had an, a way of, of uh, extracting it, then even common mantras or everyday expressions like how's the weather or how are you doing or how do you do, uh, which by the way is uh, not a question you'd ask of a dancist either, because if you ask how do you do, he'd say, well, I don't do anything at all, thank you. God does it all. 
So these lower grade mantras would uh, offer up some of their own profound meaning and uh, you'd be able to see them as they are and transcend and uh, go towards those words of power uh, that have, uh, according to Vedic thinking and tantric thinking and yogic thinking and the thinking of Samkhya yogis and so forth, are really the source and origin of everything. Like in the beginning was the word kind of idea. Um, I often say that when Jesus said that, he, he wasn't pointing to um, Brahman or Almighty Father. He was pointing to the origin of things. And in our tradition, God is not a creator and uh, can't be the cause of anything. It's causeless and a create, uh, uh, a word that Swami Vivekananda had to coin for us when he came here in 1893, first time, to let us know that there are some things, one thing at least, that's a create. And it's beyond creation, preservation, and destruction that even the Trinity is involved, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, in this process of projection, sustenance, and withdrawal. We, all, we like to use those words, and there's an example of the power in words, rather than creation, preservation, and destruction, because nothing, you can't create something out of nothing, and you can't destroy something that was never created. So if you say projection, sustenance, and withdrawal, it points more toward the great mind and how it projects all things, like worlds and beings and tattvas, uh, cosmic principles that I just chanted about. Uh, without her, the mother of meaning, with a vak devi, Saraswati sometimes they call her, without her, all these principles, tattvas, like earth, air, fire, water, ether, and tasting, touching, hearing, smelling, they'd be like uh, clouds with no rain. And, and uh, pardon me for saying, but many people are feeling that <laughs> lack of meaning in their lives because they don't know the intelligent principle that's in every word and how to unwrap it. Uh, the yogis know that and the avatutas and the paramahamsas and these great souls that have come to use these profound words, mantras at a very high level. So you remember last week we, we looked at some 14 facts of the mantra and uh, saw how it's uh, Vedic in origin, although we also mean tantric when we say that. Veda and Tantra are two rivers that are flowing together in and out of time in India. Uh, Vedic being more the, the idea of the pointing toward the formless through the path of wisdom, and tantric being more the, f the path of self-surrender and devotion and deification of things, uh, flowing mainly by uh, devotion and love of God pujas and worships and things of that nature. So this uh, is uh, f flowing in India from time out of mind, and they both have this great love affair with the Word. So when you hear something like, in the beginning of was the Word, which is a 2,000-year-old saying, which is not that old in India because 5,000 years prior to that, Lord Vashishta was talking about the Word in uh, ways that were much more fleshed out that is, uh, A, U, and M meant your waking, dreaming, and deep sleep state, and also meant the Trinity, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, how they engage in preservation, sustenance, and withdrawal using these words that the Divine Mother has given them. Bijams, they're called, or power words. So you can just see in the last three minutes I've been talking how deep the subject goes. And uh, how, how, if you talk Dharma at all, you're, you're going to be talking about the Almighty Father or Brahman, it's formless and uh, all-pervasive and so forth, or you're talking about its Shakti, the dynamic power in it that is one with it, like fire and its heat or water and its wetness, and then you'll be talking about the Trinity, the great cosmic mind of God, and then you'll shift to talking about uh, the eight limbs of yoga, or you know, you'll then go to the eightfold path of Buddhism, and then you'll go to the four jewels and six treasures of Vedanta, and then you'll go to all the methods of meditation, and you won't be able to find an end to the rich, profound teachings of the Dharma. Uh, and this is all called Jnana Yoga when it's digested. It's Dharma when you hear it, and you know it's part of a great ocean of wisdom called the Word that the Divine Mother herself tends. Sharda is, means a, a pool of essence, if you want to give that des 
designation, and Sharda is one of the names for Mother Saraswati. So Sharda Devi, who was my teacher's teacher, peace and bliss be upon him, Swami Sheshanandaji, who taught us for so long in the West, for some 45 years, um, was often speaking about his mantra guru in the form of Holy Mother and how he passed the mantra on to us. It's as if, as I was saying before, we all got started here at this, we call Kedarnath Center here in, on the Big Island, uh, talking about how when Flight Vivekananda came over in 1893, rather the first that uh, was of notable stature and who made such a profound splash, as it were, at the Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893, all the teachers since him that were true authentic teachers were taking a look at Westerners for the first time, and the Westerners were taking a look at Eastern yogis and luminaries for the first time. It was a, a very interesting time. And uh, we were in America, we, we were into big tent revivals and seances and living rooms to try and contact our dead spirits of our ancestors. It's basically what religion looked like in the late 1800s in, in America. So they took one look at us, some of these great teachers, and said, this doesn't uh, bode very well for their future. Uh, th there's a lot of work to be done here. I think what we need to do, uh, until they can develop some aptitude for the Dharma, that means it would still be some 60, 70, 50, 60, 70 years before Tibetan Buddhists came to them and Zen Buddhism came to them and Vedanta grew and showed itself more of the underground river of Vedanta. And, Yogi, uh, the, the yogas began to come forward over those ha half a century and more. So w with all that on the, in the future, they said, well, it's going to be very difficult for them to qualify themselves in something as powerful as Jnana Yoga, uh, uh, w which the word very much exemplifies here. You have to be using these power words like, like Brahman and Shanti and Guru and uh, and Aparinama, the transformationless nature of everything. Everything seems to be transforming, but it isn't. Everything seems to be being born and dying, but it isn't. You see, to get to the real truth of the matter, you're going to have to ground yourself in some of these very deep and profound axioms. Uh, we call that non-dualism or Advaita Vedanta. And, uh, and so for that case, in that case, then what can we do for them? Let's give them the mantra. So they can start working on their subconscious and unconscious minds, if you want to use two Western expressions, for something that is actually much deeper in Dharma. Your subconscious and unconscious mind really are aligned with your dreaming and deep sleep state. And these are not just phantoms of your imagination. These are actually kings of heaven within that you go to every night. Your consciousness shifts from waking and takes on five subtle senses and goes to dream. And then it gives up those five senses and takes on a causal body, which is formless and peaceful and blissful. And that's not even the end of it. They're still inside, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You still have to go straight to realization of Brahman itself. So the mantra is that, we were talking about the old commercial about Mr. Clean, how it's those scrubbing bubbles that uh, if you saw the commercials back in the 60s and 70s, I can actually sing the theme song for that if you'd like. Mr. Clean can clean your whole house and everything that's in it. Um, and he's a muscle guy and he's bald like a monk, you see, and he's, he's been pumping something. Uh, but I won't engage any further than that or digress. Just enough to say that the mantra does the work on those levels of mind. Uh, we wouldn't be so quick to assign them just psychological uh, uh, ramifications alone, like, oh, you need to sit down and tell me about this, and then I need to say to you, how do you feel about this, and then you need to vent all your emotions and do this kind of catharsis and everything <laughs> that we've been seeing for the last 30 or 40 years in the West. Really, they want you to hear the dharmic part of that teaching uh, about uh, the profundity of your levels of consciousness, that you actually shift these through these three levels, the three worlds, yourself. And you do that at your own auspice, and there's no guide for you and, uh, until you find one, of course, if you look deeper. 
Um, <clears throat> so this is something that people are doing every 24 hours. They're actually being born and, and living and dying every 24 hours uh, to form, because form is life for most people. And uh, so, uh, and then formlessness is death, is a kind of death. And what goes in between their sandwich in between is a, is a kind of fantasy that's going on, a dreamlike fantasy that's going on, which is why row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, life is but a dream kind of idea. So uh, unless you can make it more meaningful and more profound, and the way in which the word will work is, is sort of a combination of the path of sound and the path of wisdom. That is, Shabda Brahman is the path of sound in India, and um, jnana yoga is the path of wisdom. So if you were able to, and this is the path I've walked all my life, these twin paths, is, I'm describing the path that I walk predominantly. If uh, you were able to put those two together, as I was a musician, so that helped, uh, that the sound of things was very important to me and how, how it has to be in tune and the intonation of it's very important and the pronunciation of it and, and how, uh, if you heard like uh, some saying that's out there nowadays, it's been said before, is that uh, 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 words cannot say what notes can convey. I heard that the other day. Words cannot say what notes can convey. Well, notes means music. So right away we're in an argument between <laughs> the poets and the musicians, you see. <laughs> and that's not going to be, that's going to be counterproductive. What, what you really should be saying is that um, both of these are two paths, the words and uh, sound. Uh, and uh, the wisdom, if you put the two together, you've got this dharma or this kind of wisdom, which I was just speaking about, how marvelous that is to, to uh, encounter the dharma with all its many facets and sit and think about it in silence. <coughs> it's like your mind is an instrument you haven't learned to play yet, you see. <coughs> and it's got many strings. And, and yet, the divine troubadour, Ram Prasad has a song where he says, Oh, Mother, you're the divine troubadour. Would you please tune the strings of my mind so that I can play in tune, <laughs> so my life can be harmonious and I can play a divine music instead of this sorrowful odes of, of suffering that I'm playing every day with my instrument out of tune, you see. Sort of like seeing out of focus, hearing out of tune, you see. So all of these things are in preamble, my usual preamble, to the idea of how important words are and you wouldn't want to say to a Vedantas, what's in a word? Maybe you would, because then if he or she knew what they were talking about, they'd start to tell you what's in a word. And they'd probably say, first you have to go to the letters. You know, oh yeah, okay, spell it. And, and that's about as far as the Westerner would go with his form of education. It, matter and material being the aim, pleasure and uh, ownership and agency you know, being the aims of the unripe ego. Uh, in matter <coughs> uh, in, in a materialistic society, but they would say, no, not just how to spell it. You have to get, take the letter and pull it apart. You have to meditate on the letter. Uh, because if you can meditate on the letter and uh, penetrate it the way a scientist would have penetrated an atom, then on a, on a subtle level, that is in this next level of dreaming or visualization, you'll be releasing powerful letters uh, and find that the mother herself is in them. So, so that gets to this first chart, actually. Uh, I didn't plan it to segue that way, but I think I'll stop the preamble so we can get down to <coughs> covering some ground as far as the mantra is concerned. Now, mantranam jiva bhuta tulya so Pamashmrita is what I started out the class saying. So mantra means the, the, the mantra with the name in it, uh, the divine name in it. So mantras are usually seen to be consisting of a divine name. So you're talking about something that has to do with the form of God. If you have a problem with the form of God, then you've, uh, you've probably put yourself at odd with the tantric way of looking at things. Um, and probably that's the fault of religion in its present state. 
um, 2,000 years of Christian Christianity and 2,000 years of Hinduism pretty much amount to the same thing. The original religions of those, uh, uh, the original meaning in those religions really got uh, text tortured as far as the scriptures were concerned and the meaning really got leached out of them. And so uh, we, we have to look deeper into uh, the actual teachings of the Christ and the actual teachings of Krishna uh, to find out uh, how they s looked at mantras and slokas and sutras and in the Quran suras they're called and um, how they studied them and how they you know reverenced them I mean, sometimes I see some of my students you know they're, they're going to study their notes or they're going to read a scripture and so they'll have a cup of coffee there and they'll be sitting at a table and you know, uh, relaxing and so I said that's not the way to do it. You sit like this. You take up the book. You read it. You put it down. You close your eyes. You think of this. You roll the sloka over and over in your head, and uh, you extract some essence out of it. And you don't have any pleasures or worldliness or any of that around. And they don't seem to be able to get that. That you have to follow a tradition in the way it was realized, and uh, uh, that would help you in your formal training of how to understand deeper things. Straight spine, for instance, you're so big on asanas and how many positions you can get into, but can you sit for a half hour with a book in your hand with a straight spine and, and, and uh, full concentration, the sixth limb of yoga, have full concentration in what you do, or you're going to take time out for a sip of latte and uh, you know, uh, cross and uncross your legs and shift your position on some comfortable cushion or something. You've got to do the tradition the way it's demanded of you uh, to show the mother of wisdom that you're qualified to, to receive the deepest teachings that the mantra can convey. Because there's something very powerful in there that obviously people are missing. If they're running around from guru to guru asking for mantras as if they were some sort of prize out of a Cracker Jack box. Or if they were some sort of merit badge you could sew on your on your, your costume, you see. Uh, uh, that, that's not going to, to take you very deep into the real meaning of, of the mantra and the ability to cut through all the appearances of things and use it the way it's meant to, to take you straight to the mother herself. That's here, the fourth stage, Pashanti it's called. So if we were to follow this, which is what I want to do first, and put it together with this, which I showed two months ago here, and some of you very much loved it, and I'm not going to go through it the way I went through it two months ago. You can look back on that live streaming class. Um, but I will this time show the stages of the four stages, how, what happens inside of each four stage with the description of the four stages from the scriptures. So that if you're practicing mantra, if you have a mantra from a teacher, that is, you should have, if you're practicing mantra, as I was saying last week, we've heard of people that got a mantra from a lawyer or got a mantra from a surfer on the beach or got picked up by, by you know, a hitchhiker and the hitchhiker gave him the mantra. I mean, this is all, of course, nonsense. You have to get it from a person who's got it from their teacher and who's practiced it for many lifetimes and knows the meaning of words. They say, well, Thanks for the mantra, what's it mean? Well, I have no idea, the person will say. No, no, I mean, give me the meaning of Om Namah Shivaya, what each word means. You should be able to get a, the meaning of not only what every word means, but what each letter means. Start with Om. Oh, you mean O-M? No, that's not philosophically correct, it's A-U-M. Why do we spell it philosophically correctly? Because A stands for your waking state, U for your dreaming state, and M for your deep sleep state, and Turiya, that is the little one-eyed smile that you see in the Sanskrit letter. That stands for transcendent of waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. So right away, you're on the track to formlessness. Oh, you mean I'm supposed to go beyond the idea of creation, preservation, instruction? Beyond waking, dreaming, and deep sleep to get what they call enlightenment. And I just chanted that at the beginning of this class. Knowing that all of this is Brahman, and recognizing that uh, day to day, is what is called enlightenment. So we can quit asking the question, what is enlightenment? It's knowing that all is Brahman and keeping track of that each day. 
your in-breath is A, your held breath is U, your out-breath is M. See? Uh, and the kumbhaka that transpires when the breathing goes away is the turiya, your fourth state of awareness. So you have three states of awareness. You have three bodies that go with them. And you have a set of tattvas that are like clouds without rain if you don't know what those mean. So you need to take account of that every day. Uh, somebody asked me recently in an email, well, uh, you gave me the mantra and I wanted to, I wanted to ask you what hrim means in the mantra. I said, well, h, ha, means everything that's in the waking state. Your five elements, air, earth, fire, water, and ether. Your five senses, tasting, touching, hearing, smelling, and seeing. This is described in the Srimad Devi Bhagavatam on page such and such. So I told him where to go for it and what it means. And then ha, ra, what does ra mean? That's the same thing in dreaming. You've got five senses in dreaming, too. You see, taste, touch, hear, and smell in a dream. And uh, you also have five elements in a dream, don't you? Because you see land and you see fire. and So you just shifted from the gross world to the subtle world, and uh, you should connect those two quickly, you see. If you connect the A with the U, then you're, that's two-thirds of the battle. People leave them disconnected, don't they? Oh, I had a dream last night. Well, did you know that from your dream came your waking? And that if you meditate on your waking dream, you can go back to, to meditating in your dreaming state, and you can see the connections between the two, and that's the whole start to your spiritual path, your inner journey, has to be noting all of the tattvas and how they connect. Like earth with smell, like water with taste, like fire with light. See? So, uh, and, and uh, touch with air, see, and, and hearing with ether. Uh, these are yoga, this is yoga 101, see. So somebody studied this, gave it out to you, realized it in deep meditation, sh told it to their students, and their students then have to follow the tradition of connecting the dots. 2,000 to 5,000 years later, they have to do this, especially if they're a lost culture with no God or with no knowledge of anything beyond uh, waking as, as your reality. So if you go to a teacher and the teacher thinks you qualified and ready, you'll get a mantra. So what happened to me, uh, I had to wait a year after I asked, and a year later I got the mantra from my teacher. And he told me what it meant at the time of initiation during, on a holy day. And he had practiced it for 80 years himself, and he had gotten it from a person who was a fully realized soul. And uh, so this is how it got transmitted to me and to others who were around me at the time uh, in, in a city of uh, several hundred thousand. Maybe 30 of us got the mantra, you see, uh, at that time, and hopefully more later before he passed from the body. So a very select amount of people got this special formula that has the divine name in it, which for us would be Sri Ramakrishna or Sri Sharda Devi, and next to a power bijam. Power Bijam is a seed that, if you could see it, would be back in your deep sleep state. And the deep sleep state is like the great mind of God, where everything is blissful, formless, peaceful. It's not Brahman yet. It's not the light. But it has a light of its own. And that's where all these seeds are. So when you water these seeds as an individual, you come out into a dream called heaven. And from there, you water them further, you come out into a waking state called earth. And uh, you, if you can do that in a body, it doesn't mean that you just do it once and that's it. Then you're doing it every 24 hours here in the waking state. You're just going back to your source, the Word, and coming back. So you're actually very accomplished at taking the formlessness and putting it into form. You just don't know a few th important things. One is that you're the one that's doing it. And two, that it's all a divine play. That's kind of a sport. And you shouldn't be so, uh, so damn attached to it, you see, and clinging selfishly. We're talking about selfish clinging being one of the uh, akushalas in Buddhism, you know, grasping, selfish grasping. 
like her ego's a devil with nails as long as winnowing hooks, just glomming onto everything, you see one of the songs of India says. So uh, that uh, mantra that you got from a teacher then, uh, and my teacher told me this at the time, he said, uh, what I'm giving you now is called Vaikari. I'm going to give you the mantra that's associated with the physical form, and he showed me Holy Mother's picture. See, his teachers said, he said to me, uh, when I came to the West, she had passed away, and I really needed her, being a, a solo monk here in the West, away from my country. He never went back to his country again. He gave him home, his whole self to the United States of America. And so he said, but, but now I want to show you how I reached her. It was in meditation. Her physical form was gone. And uh, so by using the mantra, you see, I made contact with her, her subtle body, and could communicate with her. I want to show that all to you. I showed you her form in the altar, he said one day in a lecture. Now I want to show you her in my heart. See? So he had made the connection from the outer to the inner by using this powerful mantra. And it probably went much deeper from him than that um, in the 94 or 5 years that he lived on earth, almost the entire time up as a monk. And so all of this, again, a further preamble as I make my way to showing you the connections in this first half between these two charts. Let's read the first quote so I can, it can help us flesh out this idea of the power in words. All the alphabets and their corresponding fractions and the mantras comprised of them are all intrinsically connected with the self. Notice that the self is capitalized. It means the Atman. It's not the ego, in other words. Due to the influence of nescience, the Maya Shakti covers their true meaning and function and the eternal self takes on a sense of individuality and assumes atomic proportions. Recitation of the mantra awakens the power inherent in the word and restores meaning, thus wisdom. So if you've come so far out to get to the Vaikari stage, which is here, it means gross, vibrating very densely, and you find yourself here, you need a way back then you get the form of the mother, physical form of the mother, with the word, with the mantra. If you're fortunate enough to have found those two, that's called guru and dharma, and then you get a sangha with that. It's called the triple gem in Buddhism. Guru, dharma, sangha. Om tari tu, tari turi swaha, ayu punyagana pukin guru swaha in Tibet, in Tibetan. So you get the triple gem, and it starts out with this Vicari level. So look at Vicari on this chart. <coughs> I'm sorry, the uh, camera person is going to have to switch back and forth to, to show us these. And uh, maybe I won't do that with my device here. I'll just look. Uh, you can see in the first Vicari phase how much happens before the Madhyama phase connects. You see. Uh, oh, earlier actually I said Pashanti was the highest. I meant, because they're going this way, I meant Para. Para is the supreme. So we're going this way around the chart and back, left to right. So let's hear the description of the Vicari stage before we look at this, because it might be much the same. Uh, the fourth stage, which means really the first stage if you're coming outside in, because uh, uh, Para would be supreme, Pashanti would be second, Madhyama would be third, and Vicari would be fourth. So. This is the fourth and most outward state of all, where we're getting the mantra as you're hearing words from me right now. If I say Om Namah Shivaya, then I'm mentioning a mantra in Shaivism, and you're hearing the physical form of it leave my vocal cords, vibrate across the air, hit your eardrums, and hopefully your eardrums is connected to something inside that recognizes sound. Uh, not just intelligence, but a deeper intelligence even. Uh, because all of a sudden, it's kind of a miracle, isn't it, that you can sit and hear someone talk and understand what they're saying? Have you ever thought of that? It says, wow, what is that? That's her, you see. 
that's her in, in a very subtle level. It's just the power of comprehension. And that's what we want to waken up in people again, uh, that they'll hear what you're saying. You see, <laughs> what a novel idea. I know what you're thinking, you see, but people should actually hear what I'm saying and understand it. Uh, how strange is that? But that's the depth to which we've fallen as far as low, uh, that we're, we're not listening. And if someone says to you, how's the weather, you should be able to describe to them philosophically how the weather is. Not just say, fine, you see, and let them get away with it. You take them to task, see, or how are you? And you'd have to say, well, actually there is no me, you know, in Vedanta, so I can't really say how I am because I don't exist. You know, I mean, you could go all sorts of profound directions with even the low-grade mantras. I'll show you that at the second half. Uh, so the fourth stage, Vaikari, represents the articulate form of sound at which stage the mantra charges and purifies the mind, revealing the presence of the antaryami, another profound word which means inner ruler control, uh, uh, inner ruler divine, and, and, uh, the inner ru Im ruler immortal seated in the heart. Yeah. Uh, or something like that. I remember Mr. Morosi, my Vedanta teacher on Oahu, and the inner ruler immortal seated in the heart. So there's this divine presence. We'd probably call that Atman. Or your Ishtam, seated in your heart. The sound Brahman is then perceived. One's awareness intensifies. The breathing stills. Kundalini rises and the inner visions occur. So this is all in the first stage. You say, well, what's wrong with me? <laughs> I got the mantra and that's, none of that happened to me yet, you see. Um, so uh, either you're not really practicing it very deeply or intensely or with enough faith or uh, so, so forth, uh, or maybe you know, it's going to take 10 or 20 years for Vicari to actually occur to you. Uh, they used to say that to us, it says, you know, when you get the mantra, you're liberated. Wow, see, moksha, we got moksha, we return to our original state. But, there's always a but to these things, your mind, you know, will have to catch up with the fact that you just got liberated. That's always the way I heard it. See? So the mind is slow, so we used to say slower than the uh, speed of, uh, faster than the speed of, of sound is the speed of light. Faster than the speed of light is the speed of mind, it's thought. And faster than the fastest, slower than the slower, higher than the higher, lower than the lowest is Shakti. She outstrips everything that runs. That's intelligence. The intelligence is actually already there when the words come out of deep sleep and, and burgeon. She's already there. Uh, Srimad Devi Bhagavatam says, the victory is already won. She's there in everything. You see, uh, so you don't have to worry about a thing, you know, just Listen to her words and make them live inside of you and follow them. So uh, it's very profound, the Vicari stage, put into that one paragraph. Uh, the fastest of it there is that it charges and purifies the mind. It's the first thing you want to know. So if the mind is dull and you're using the mantra what, right, it's like, like I did yesterday with my old car. I had to charge up a charger to it so the battery would fire it. So it's, it's like your mind is kind of a dead battery, but it's still got some acid in it that can be recharged, you see. So you clamp on those, those chargers and charge it to the mantra, charge it up with the mantra. As Jeremiah Chris used to say, it's like putting hot air in a helium balloon, you see. So the mind has to, you know, it sags, you see, and it, it falls low. So you have to charge it up with this helium and, so, and throw out the sandbags, and then it'll just naturally rise. So you can talk about <coughs> uh, dull mind, and you can talk about scattered mind, and you can talk about uh, worldly mind and normal mind, and you could probably then talk about higher mind. And uh, the nature of all of these is, if you charge up the mind, will be to rise in stature, in, in consciousness, uh, like in meditation, to uh, charge up your, your mind. And, Remember, we always have to say this, we're not talking about the brain. The brain will take advantage of this process too. 
and then it'll sharpen the senses. You see, the senses are attached to that and so forth. But the senses are also attached to the mind because they're subtle senses in the picture. So all of this is a kind of cosmology that you'll put together over time and which the mantra will help sew up like the beads of a, of a mala, you see, or of a rosary. Just sew them all together into 108 solid principles. I have a, a chart about that, you know, uh, about the, uh, I don't think I brought it today, but next week about the meaning of every bead of your mala. <laughs> so if you have a, I actually took a mala with 108 beads and assigned a meaning to every one around in a circle on a chart. And be surprised what every bead means. You see, it's got a name of God assigned to every bead. And uh, so probably what you'll first want to do is get some milk and some butter and sit with your teacher and dip your mala in this mixture of milk and butter and say the mantra, all the mantras over it, and then wipe it off and uh, dry it and use it. You have to immerse your mala once a year in the tradition so that, you know, you take care of it like you would take care of, say, oh, your precious car that won't start. Have to take care of it. So you can see by these first two paragraphs, top and here, how powerful it is. But purifying the mantra is very important because yourself is hiding in there. You see, covered over. You're antaryami. It's a beautiful Sanskrit word. Inner ruler immortal. That's what it is. Inner ruler immortal seated in the heart. So that's a very profound thing. Now let's look quickly just right here, these first nine points. You receive the mantra from a guru, make sure this is an authentic guru, uh, who tells you what it means. That is, you have to know what Om means, you have to know what Namaha means, and you have to know what Shivaya means, if that's, that's probably the most currently uh, popular known mantra, that, so I can use it here, you see, Om Namah Shivaya. Uh, so a lot of people have heard of that. So you'd start with OM and spell it A-U-M and assign everything to those three letters. That's how you begin to know what the mantra means, just the very first word of it. So I'm reiterating that so you know that just receiving a mantra from anyone is not going to be that efficacious. You probably get tired of it in a few weeks or a month and go looking for a new teacher who can give you another one and then follow this route all the time. So basically that's Vaikari number one. Vaikari two is animate, it animates the chitta. So it's another way of saying here that it charges up. What is the chitta? Thought. Your thought's low. It's dragging. It's worldly. It could even turn evil and backfire on you and so forth. And dull or too active, restless. Tamas, rajas, right? Under the influence of the two gunas. So you want to animate the chitta in a new way so that it has... Uh, a way inward, inward ascension, inward and upward. Vaikari 3, awakened mind to the antaryami. We know that now. For anahata sound is detected. Anahata means om, A-U-M. You'll hear it humming uh, in your meditation. Uh, the yogis hear it, uh, starting with their meditation on the... Uh, Manipura chakra, if you want to go kundalini on this, the third chakra in the, in the uh, uh, corresponding with the, the stomach, you see, the belly. And then to the fourth chakra is called the anahata chakra. You see, so you can see how important that is to hear that sound and follow it inward. Sri Ramakrishna's story was you're going over sand dune, sand dune, sand dune, towards this distant sound. And as you get over the last sand dunes, the sound becomes so loud. Finally you break over the last sand dunes and there's the ocean with its waves and children playing and sailboats and you finally reach the ocean of Om. So he says that's the way you follow the sound of Om, distant at first like over many sand dunes and closer and closer to you hear it humming in your head like a thousand bumblebees as the scriptures say. All right, Vicari 5, thoughts dissolve. So here you are. You go to some teacher and he says, don't think. How effective is that going to be? You see, you'd have to be a pretty advanced meditator before you even found your teacher, which is possible. 
But just to sit there and dissolve your thoughts, you see, that's very difficult for people to do. If they do accomplish that, they'll have to watch their thoughts for several hours or several days until finally, you know, as the Tibetan Buddhists say, the clouds all pass and there's the open sky of awareness. The open sky of clear awareness all of a sudden. So, you know, the thoughts will, the chitta that you've just animated will part. See, and you'll have this deep, peaceful, profound meditation, finally, you see, instead of the dull one or the restless one, you see. So this can get very deep, this, this uh, fifth part, but uh, I'm just saying that there is a lead up to it that people don't necessarily activate in the tradition. Uh, can't go any further, any deeper, but saying, get an authentic teacher and have him transmit to you the mantra and stay with it for a lifetime. Uh, and uh, have faith in your original intentions. Six, intensification of awareness. That's also mentioned here. Once awareness intensifies, the breathing stills, kundalini rises. Well, we're giving away the secret a little early. Breath becomes equalized. Kundalini awakens and rises, and the sounds and visions occur. Sounds are Shabda Brahman, and visions are, are um, say, um, <coughs> Jyoti. Sh Shabda and Jyoti. So some people will hear the sound. Shabda, these beings, their natures are more, we'll carefully use the word, um, mystical, mystic, you see. Uh, and then there's the people who are visionary. They, they see visions inside more. They, they go more by the inner sight. So you see how important it is to know that you have inner sight. You see? That not just these two eyes, because you have to make your eye single to know the truth. So the single eye, of course, is going to be all the way up here in the forehead. Six chakra is how you'd explain Jesus' teachings for that. Uh, but uh, there's also a kind of sight that happens in your subtle body with two eyes. So your eyes are not made one yet, but you're seeing finer things. You're seeing your ancestors. You're seeing your dead, your dead f uh, father or grandfather. You're seeing some guru who departed thousands of years ago. You see, and so you're having these visions in dream. Uh, so that's a kind of inward seeing, which is mentioned here at this first stage. All right, so we have looked, I think, at the first nine of Vaikari. So it's good we're taking it back from two or three months ago, looking this over again with the description, and we go to middling next. So Vikari rudimentary is a good word for that. Madhyama middling uh, stage of the mantra. So uh, the Dharma says here, Madhyama stage, which acts as an intermediary between Vikari and Pashanti. Pashanti would be this third stage. <coughs> represents the third and slightly gross form of sound. So you go from fourth to third now. Here the seeker perceives interior realms but remains clear of them, accesses occult powers yet resists them, and feels bliss but rises above them, uh, above it. So do you see where this is coming from? Does it sound familiar, those three things? That's what the father of yoga taught three of the four obstacles to meditation. You see? You remember that? First is that, uh, you know, uh, your cold powers rise, so you, you have to beware of them. Subtle bliss comes to you, you have to transcend it. And visions of the worlds, the lokas inside, kingdoms of heaven within you, the mansions of, of the Father's house, however you want to put that, also come, and you have to just witness them. So here's the real power of witness. You've identified with this world through your reincarnation, that is your incarnation in a body, and you're now identified with it with your five gross senses. Do you want the same thing to happen in dream state with the occult powers and with the heavenly realms? Because there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of souls who are going to heaven and returning to earth. So India has always looked askance at that kind of evolution or involution evolution, involution. And its scriptures, the Upanishads, which are the core essence of Vedanta, has told you that uh, you, uh, 
I want to give up the heaven-seeking senses, see? the pleasure in heaven-seeking senses. You sought pleasure here, it's accompanied by pain. There might be even a greater danger of seeking pleasure in heaven because it's not accompanied with pain. But it is accompanied by rebirth in the worlds of pain. So this is something you're going to have to consider very deeply. Knowing the power of words isn't hel is helping you right now, right? Because you know what lokas and akashas and heavens and earths and ancestors, pitris they're called in Sanskrit, the wheel of samsara, you know you've heard about all that. So now you have to connect that and be very careful in your inner process, you see, this inner dynamism that's going on within you. So perceives the interior realms but remains clear of them, accesses occult powers yet resists them, and feels bliss but rises above it. So this bliss is not the bliss of the Atman yet. It's the bliss of the ego. It's a kind of samadhi, but it can restrict you to, uh, to uh, not, not being able to access real bliss, which is with a capital B Sanskrit word is Ananda. Let's see. There are thousands and thousands of souls with the last name of Nanda. Don't get me started. So here's the description of this. You perceive the inner realms. Everything is seen. Oh, I'm sorry. Here, sorry. Perceive the inner realms. Nada is clearly heard. So it's a... Uh, let's go on. Awareness, is foc awareness focuses on Om. You resist the inner worlds. The aspirant rejects occult powers and then stays detached from bliss. So back here, nada's, nada is clearly heard, means that if you take it, if you understand the meaning of the word nada, which is not in our vocabulary in English or any other language in the world, in 50 some different alphabets and their, their various uh, uh, other uh, uh, forms of language that come off the main ones. Basically, you've got this one word in Sanskrit called nada, which is not a Brahman, which means the sound Brahman. It's Brahman expressing itself at the highest level through sound. Through, vi through vibration would be a good way of saying it. I'm causing vibration in the air now, and it's hitting your eardrum, so even that's a miracle, you see. And uh, if people become uh, insensitive or desensitized to words that are being thrown at them, like nowadays, oh my God, the media and what's happening in politics, you can't, you know, a sane person isn't going to want to listen to even 15 seconds of what they're saying on those programs before turning away. It's just just a pounding of nonsense against the eardrums with no real effect in the end, a flapping of gums, a working about a froth around the lips. I'm quoting Vivekananda, and that was before the media got real big. So you turn away from that kind of thing, searching for deeper words. I'm going to sit here and talk to you for three hours, and you can say, oh boy, that guy can sure talk up a streak, you see. But there's no, I'm not going to say one thing that's not in the tradition and that's not true and that is not spiritually based. And these are things that we feel beings need to hear. They're higher grade mantras, if you want to put it. They're jnanam, they're dharma. So uh, here's, uh, if you want to call it, one aspect of the dharma is mantra, but you can see how many-sided it is already and we're nowhere near through with it. So you remember last week we took up the 21 or the 14 facts of the mantra and looked at that. So you can see here, nada is clearly heard. Uh, I want to explain further that nada is the nada brahma or shabda brahman. It's God manifesting as sound at a very high level, like at the, at the level of the word, om. But nadis carry it. So the, there's a second uh, meaning to the word and it's very important for us because it's a channel that, that they say the yogis open the nadis so that they can see the light of Brahman and hear the sound of Brahman. That's back here, right? Uh, sounds and visions occur. So they've done some practice 
that's extraordinary, that isn't, you know, lower knowledge or, or uh, secular knowledge or even mixed knowledge and so forth. They've, they've come upon and, and attained and apprehended this higher knowledge from their teachers. And they, by meditating on it, it's opening up channels through the waking state to the dream state, if you want to put it that way. And they can go along those channels each night. They may maybe could further that nadi with each meditation until finally it reaches its destination. Now, if you want to put this in terms of kundalini, you've got the shushumna going up the separate central channel, and you've got the ida and the pingana going like this around the central channel. So those are huge nadis. And off of them connect many, many subtler nadis. Ara Eva Ratanabao Samhata Yatra Nadyaha Sa Ishon Chastarate Buhuda Jaya Manaha. There in the center, in the heart, where all the subtle nerve endings connect and meet, like the spokes of a chariot wheel at the hub, abides the Atman. Is out of the Svetashvatar Upanishad. That's Vedanta. So it's a Kundalini flavored Vedanta that, that we have there. So I'm not just bringing in Kundalini randomly here. The yogis know about Kundalini. They know that it connects to who? She, whom the saints and sages worship and remember as the imperishable Shakti. She. See. That's how I started out the class today, with that mantra out of the tantras. So <coughs> connects to her. So these nadis are going to ultimately take you right to the Maha Shakti. And uh, these nadis have been closed, you see, maybe for thousands of years, maybe for dozens of lifetimes in people. It's just like not blazing a trail to the top of the mountain through a forest. And so the trail just becomes clogged and you can't even remember or see where the trail was. You have to get out there with a machete and cut through there again where you think the trail might have been and then keep it open. So. By concentrating on the Lord, loving the Lord and Mother of the Universe, using your mantra, that's the machete you're talking about. And you say it every day, and you think its meaning every day. You remind yourself of it every day and every night. And that clears these nadis. That mantra clears these nadis. And you can move in and out of waking and dream state, and maybe even to deep sleep state, of all things, consciously instead of unconsciously, and just letting Maya do the, do the whole thing for you, you see. Just give it all up and just, whatever happens, man, you know, the random workings of Maya in you, and you're just allowing it. So you have a conscious, self-aware path that you're carving out each day and keeping clear. I polish my mind every day like it was a mirror that had dust on it, you know, Shankara said. And his student says, well, you're already enlightened. Why do you have to do that? Because I'm talking about my mind. <laughs> Myself never collects any dust. But the mind in Maya here, in form, collects dust. So I keep it polished every day with my practice so that I can get the clearest vision of God. You see, sounds and visions occur. You perceive the inner realms. You look at them as a witness only, and you don't get attached to them. Why should you attach to them? You'll just repeat what you did here on Earth. Not only at the time, but in the future when you go back, because you're still attached to worlds, forms, pleasures, heaven-seeking senses. This is how deep India's Dharma goes. I've never found a lack of it, except, of course, in, in those forms of it that went out. Buddhism, like Zen, Tibetan Buddhism, and so forth. Uh, that's all from Mother India, based on these, this original dharmic knowledge, the Sanatana Dharma. Sanat means eternal. It's always there. But like everything else, can get covered up, like one of those nadis. So I'm going on and on about this word nada and connecting it to the word nadi, so that when you do a meditation and you hear that you should collect dharma drops in the bucket, that you know that you're adding to the deepening of your nadis each meditation and each study of scripture and each class you attend with your guru and each puja you do 
uh, in front of the shrine and so forth, you should consciously assess these things and say, this is to my credit. This is merit. Everything else is papa, demerit. See, this is punya. Two other very powerful words in the Dharma, punya and papa. If you had a, a real bad father, it'd be, you know, double meaning to call him papa. <laughs> Let's take three. Uh, which is right here, right? You see how you end there. And Bashanti gets finer with fewer points. Let's read it. Did I read everything else yet from two Madhyama? Of course, endless commentary can flow from this. But let's go on to Bashanti here. And of course, there in the middle is Holy Mother's picture. So we probably don't want to forget her because she's the perfect in mantra. <laughs> Shadi day, oh shadi day, Vikya vinashane shadi day. Shadi day, oh shadi day, Brahma sanatani shadi day. Vikya vinashane shadi day. Brahma Sanatani Sharade Brahma Swarupani Sharade Patita Pavani Sharade Karuna Rupani Sharade Namo Narayani Sharade coming soon to CD Baby and Pandora. I mean, it's, it's, it's some of these beautiful pieces on Jaima Music will be able to be heard now on your streaming devices as we put them out for people to enjoy. Uh, talk about very sparse words here. You just have her word, her name, Sharada. The, they called her Japa Harini, perfect in the art of Japa. She said, oh, the master, Sri Ramakrishna, my husband, my divine consort, when he was alive, taught me all the mantras and how they connect to all the deities. So that's a lot of mantric wisdom to know. Uh, what mantra would suit which person and which god those words connect to, like Om Namah Shivaya again. So... Uh, you just have Sharda there, and then, you know, she's, she's the destroyer of obstacles, Vikya Vinashane. She's the eternal Brahman, one with the eternal Brahman, Brahman Sanatani. She's the essence of ecstatic love for God, Prema Swarupini, essence Swarupini. She's the savior of the fallen and lowly. In, a, in addition to all that, she comes down and helps the fallen and the lowly. Patita Pavana. She's the embodiment of compassion for all beings. Karuna Rupini. Rupini is the form. She's the very form of compassion. And she's, and we salute her. Namo Narayani Sharade. So in, in that way, we, with her picture there in the front, a nice artistic rendering of her, we sing to her as we study this third level. Pashanti says, represents the subtle and second stage of sound. Om, perceived earlier, now turns into light, or jyoti. An indrawn state of witness is prevalent here, and the soul experiences pure awareness beyond bliss. Pasyanti Vak is divine vision, the supreme speech of the Vak Devi, unmanifested and full of spirit. The seers and gods use it for envisioning everything. Pervading all, it extends from Muladhara up to Sarasrara, from first chakra through all the other six to the crown chakra. So that's how subtle mother mantra is and how far it can take the devotee. There is no mantra as powerful in all the worlds than mother mantra. Other mantras can take you to certain centers. The guardians at those gates will say you cannot pass any further. 
maybe you want to pass beyond the ancestor realm and the mantra you got is just throwing you back on earth. See? Maybe it wasn't, wasn't really a mantra you got, it was just some heavenly advice from some church or something. But you didn't get a teacher who had reached enlightenment by the mantra that when he gave it to you, ensured that you would always also get that same enlightenment see, by using that in the traditional way. So a lot here again in this one, one paragraph, but uh, things like witness is prevalent here and uh, you get beyond the subtle bliss into pure awareness. That's something that most people might not uh, envision or fathom. See? Gee, there's something greater than bliss. Yes, it's self-awareness. It's, it's the essence in itself. Um, and as I was reading this, I wanted to remember to say that if you took the mantra and practiced it for 5, 10, 15 years, and it left you just at the Vaikari stage, that at some point you'd have an inner vision of your Ishtam, and that would be the second form of mother. The first form of mother was her picture. Say you had Mother Kali on your altar, or Mother Mary. I wouldn't necessarily mix those two on any altar, <laughs> if you're ready for it. Or you had Mother Sharda, like we have, on our altar. Then that was Vaikari Mother you were seeing. But when you're doing her mantra and looking at her and offering her flower and waving incense in front of her, and then you go into meditation with the mantra that you're given by your teacher, who was her disciple, then what you're doing is opening these nadis, you know, past the Vaikari stage, into Madhyama. You should be aware that you're doing this. It'll make a lot more significant spiritual growth for you if you're, uh, what's the word, Aff affirming that this is happening. See, because these nadis can get covered in an evening of growth. Have you seen our bamboo here in, in the rain, see, in the islands? <laughs> wow, it grew two feet overnight. You can almost see it grow. So you come back a few days later and, you, you know, the trail to your tent flap form is already, well, get out the weed whacker, you see. So uh, it's just like that. This, these nadis can get covered if you don't keep them cut back with your own awareness. So you should affirm for yourself that this is what I'm doing with my mantra, and I'm going to get an inner vision of mother now. Uh, it's going to be a, a vision that I get at the dream state level. See, uh, I can attest because I've had visions of mother in very beautiful forms at the dream state level, where my dreams didn't seem like they were ordinary dreams anymore. And uh, sometimes a young girl, sometimes an old woman. Interesting, that's the, what they say about Mother Pele here in Hawaii, that if somebody gets a vision of her or sees her somewhere, that sometimes she appears as a little girl and some like an old kahuna uh, uh, woman, you see, in Hawaii. So uh, she can appear to you in different ways, you know, in your dream. Uh, and this is going to intensify as you reach the Pashanti level. So w w this particular um, uh, train of thought that I'm adding into this is a kind of, so you can also not just hear it, see it in the tradition, read the charts, but actually envision it happening to yourself that you're going to take this mantra and go inside with it, open nadis, and reach the Pashanti level with it, where you've got uh, divine vision and supreme speech. Uh, you know, isn't this why you go and hear your teacher for months and months, and uh, one day you'll hear him say something that he's repeated a hundred times, and all of a sudden, just like that, I understand it. You see? You think, well, is that some grace given to me in the moment? No, that was 10 years of practice or two years of listening to his classes that kept you current and constant to when you finally heard it in the right way when everything was in alignment. I mean, it's not just the planets that need to be in alignment, folks. It's all these inner elements of your being that need to be in alignment. And uh, then all of a sudden you heard it that way. Well, that's all of a sudden reaching slowly through a madhyama to a pashanti level of understanding of things. Uh, again, more can be say, said about this, but here you have it, nata reveals jodi, so sound reveals light. Witness consciousness develops. That's 
coveted by the seers. If they reach it and they see any of their students reach it, they pretty much say game over because you've seen the difference between the ego and uh, your true self. Now you have a place to go to that's beyond even the ripe ego. You can step back to the witness consciousness. Tam nyacha, uh, om nyacha tam uh, nyacha. Uh, Shankara says in uh, Vivika Chudamani, Buddhao diyam yacha ta buddhi shakshini. See, so you must connect the words that I'm saying to your mind and the mind to the uh, intellect, the intellect to the ego, and the ego to the witness, sakshini. So when you reach a state where you might say it this way, you see everything just as a dream. Everything is just a kind of mirage or an illusion. Everything is a constant go-around in samsara on the wheel. And you can step back from it and see it that way and not be so concerned with every little thing or so emotional about every little thing that happens uh, because it's constantly going on all the, all the time. Then you've developed some aspect of your witness consciousness. Sakshi Bhutam. Bhutam means events. Phenomena is a good word. And you've actually, instead of being drug from birth to death and death to birth in the, in the train of phenomena, have developed a part of yourself via using the mantra that allows you to witness it now, see? And you feel relief, see? And it's not that your compassion, because didn't we just sing to her, she's the essence embodiment of compassion, so it actually deepens your compassion to get up and out of the wheel of samsara, so that you can see people suffering from a distance. Why? Because number one, you'll know that that suffering is not real because you transcended it. And number two, you'll have a better idea and a better method and more strength to actually get back into their suffering and talk them out of it. Because you had, what What did you replace your suffering with? Bliss. First, it might have been subtle bliss, but no, let's not just put it down like it's a danger to meditation. I'd rather have subtle bliss than suffering. So you actually have been going through these stages of sound to light or suffering to, su to subtle bliss to real bliss, however way you put it, depending on your nature, your, your chitta is getting charged, your hot air balloon is rising, you're throwing more sound sandbags out of the, uh, of the whole process and becoming buoyant. And remember, pervading all, it extends from the Muladhara up to the Sahasrara. Does this mean that you suddenly uh, grabbed a hold of it and took it high? Or does it mean that it was always that way and you got to see it finally as it is? It seemed like she was rising, Kundalini rising, going from center to center, but she's always there at all seven centers. You just happened to get on one of those elevators called nadis that you yourself opened and took a ride with her inward upward to inward ascension and so she's always at all seven centers um, and so she's just got more flights leaving out of her airport you see mm -hmm. and you want to finally get on one of them see? buy your ticket and get on one of them all right, so as we reach the end of our first half here, uh, let's conclude these two uh, with this final frosting on the cake. But first, let's read about para. Anytime you hear the word para, that's the supreme state. Paramananda or Paramatman, Paramajoti, the highest light. This, the initial state beyond stages Para represents the primordial hub of potentiality and divine emanation and expression, including worlds, beings, words, and their fractions, manifest as atomic centers of consciousness. Para is the unity existing in all diversity, directly realizable through the awakening and upward ascent of Kundalini power. Shiva, Chit Shakti, and pranashakti are all associated with paravak, the supreme word. 
So this is this level of power words like om and hrim and aim and shrim, uh, words of infinite power that are known by these highest beings like uh, Lord Shiva. And Chit Shakti, of course, is the father of yoga's way. Uh, in his yoga sutras, he mentioned Chit Shakti several times as being this uh, intelligent power that takes over the whole process once you can surrender to her you see, and have faith. And, and of course, you can see that there are some prerequisites here to satisfy in order to reach such a state. Uh, so you follow the tradition and you use your teacher as an exemplar. And, uh, and I would say in this day and age, follow the, uh, uh, the, um, your original intentions. Don't, don't betray your original intentions. You came to a path and a teacher, if they were uh, based on, on uh, inspection and scrutiny and, and, care, and care and so forth, and uh, you satisfy the criterion for the, four, for the four qualities of a teacher. They need to transmit you the essence of the Dharma, number one. They need to be free of desire for you, except that you get enlightenment. They want that desire for you. And they need to live a pure and unostentatious life, a spiritual life, and they need to be a knower of Brahman. If you find this is your teacher in front of you, then you bow at, that, at those feet, Brahmapada, and you awaken. And you use that teacher as exemplar, and you never quit, and you never look back. Stopping to rest, if you have to. See, uh, gaining capacity, but always going on with the courage of your convictions. That's the expression I was looking for. You must have the courage of your convictions, or the original intention you had for yourself. Because that was when? Before you took birth. Talk about merit and covering power and revealing power is that you're here because you planned this. Now you're here and you're not going to take full advantage of it or follow the criterion of the path. Uh, that's not meat, as they say. So um, that's how deep the courage of your own conviction goes, all the way back to before you took a birth, before your consciousness uh, found itself in the fetus, see, um, a bardo, the Tibetan Buddhist called, a bardo state after you passed from the last body and before you took the next body. There's a, there's a state, of sometimes a hundred years, sometimes only a year, uh, sometimes almost immediately in some, the case of some souls, all for different reasons they're taking rebirth. Um, there could be the case of somebody so pig ignorant that they just are drugged back into that the same state they were in when they committed suicide, you see. Or there could be a case of a person who was just about to culminate some very important work, passes away, and is immediately reborn again to finish that work. There could be the case of a soul who rests for a hundred years, Holy Mother says, and so they come back again and take up uh, their position in this ancestor human loop she's referring to. There could be the case of a person who is uh, almost fully liberated and just needs one more lifetime to be free. Because in Buddhism, it takes three lifetimes to get free in that particular system. One, to you know, see the truth, the Dharma, and two, to practice it, and the third, to have one free lifetime. That is, be liberated at the time of your death so you can come back and have the life of a bodhisattva, or a jivan mukta, that we call it in our tradition. So this is all very deep and powerful. So. Reading this, you can see it's, it's denser than these three. Uh, so I'm amazed that they found something to say about it that's so powerful in the scriptures. Uh, it'd be very difficult to put this together unless you'd actually experienced it. So it's, uh, it's proof of itself just by the words. And we are talking about words here, aren't we? So here it is expressed in the par state. The Vak Devi resides. So, uh, because you, you, know, you had a glimpse of the Antaryami at one point, and you got behind all the temptations, the heavenly temptations, and you actually developed witness consciousness, then you find out that I am she. 
That's how the tantrists say it. Saham is the mantra. Sometimes they say aham brahmasmi and so forth. But if they say saham, they mean I am she. So the tantrists, the lovers of Divine Mother, have their own one word mantra for that. And uh, you must get yourself fully awakened, they say, by, by uh, knowing her. So this is where Vakdevi presides. And if you want to go back to this word chit shakti that we were just talking about, that's how Father of Yoga experienced it himself. So he put it in the Yoga Sutras. There are two particular sutras in which he talks about chit shakti taking over the ego's old position. Because remember, you joined these words to your mind, right? Then you joined your mind to your intelligence or intellect. Then you joined that to your ego, and your ego got ripe. Then you joined that to the witness, which was beyond your ego, which was one with the all-seeing. And you joined that with Brahman. Because why? Shankara concludes, because Brahman is the soul in everything. So she's going to lead you through the mantra to the soul in everything, the meaning of everything, the hidden power in everything, right on down to the atom, which has a lot of power in it. And so this is how you go deeper so that you won't fall afoul of, of finding out that there's power in an atom. <laughs> you probably understand what I'm saying by that. Release it for the wrong reasons. Well, you can also release it for the wrong reasons here. You see, a great power in words, but you're using it for heavenly pleasures. Back on Earth, you're using that same power in the atom to cause havoc in the world and dominate over other nations. So you can see how the mantra purifies you see, and animates the citta and sends you in directions which are otherworldly, which are non-ordinary, which are spiritual instead of worldly. So the Vak Devi presides. That's pretty much what you saw when you saw the Antaryami seated in your heart. And then Rishihood is attained. That's a very high state. The Indian Rishis, of course, are the ones who are vouchsafed this Dharma in family lines mostly. And uh, then uh, sent them on at first just by uh, vocalization. Teach your children just by words, no books. And then later got written down as the Upanishads and so forth in a later age. So the uh, Rishis and their children were very profoundly active in spiritual life using the power of words, mantras and scriptures, slokas and sutras. And uh, this has been a gift that they're giving to us particularly along the path of Shabda, Brahman, the path of the word. Finally, everything is seen as mantra or the word. Uh, everything is a vibrating aspect here of Brahman, Brahman's word. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, then the word was God. So you saw it all as that. So between the time when you saw it all as that and you were starting out on the path, what changed? See, what got stripped away? And uh, so your witness will tell you. See, if you tune into your witness, you'll say, "Well, look at how much got shed as I used the mantra and in one lifetime got myself free. So that's my presentation for this first half of this class. I'm going to look with you at, after the break at... Uh, the food mantra and the Gayatri mantra, just to give you a look at some particular mantras that we're using for certain aspects of our life, what we say over our food and what we say to the mother, the Gayatri goddess, uh, and study each one of those word by word. It won't take very long, but it'll impress upon our minds deeper the power of mantra and what it can avail us of everything from higher wisdom to knowledge of our true self. So here, then, let's take a break of 15 minutes and return. Namaste.